We have heard messages after messages on victory over sin, receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving the Lateran. We have seen why it is imperative for us to receive the Spirit of God. But what we will see is that the reason why we need the Spirit the most is because there is coming a crisis. What's coming? There is coming a crisis. And the Bible tells us that the only way that we can prepare for this crisis is not because of the money that we have obtained from our professions. It is not because of people that we might know, but that the only way we can prepare for this crisis is by knowing and knowing only Christ. How can we prepare for this crisis? It is by knowing Christ. We see that there was an example of a man in the Bible who was preparing for a crisis. And Christ has likened this man or this event that took place in time past to what's going to come upon the world. And these end times, Ellen White says, as an overwhelming surprise. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. And I hope you have your Bibles this evening. You have your Bibles? You have your notes? Hebrews 11. In verse 7. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. The Bible says, are we there? Amen. Amen. The Bible says, by faith, Noah being warned of whom? Of God, of things not seen as Yet, so what were those things that were not seen as yet that Noah was preparing from? If you have not seen something, what do you classify that? Prophecy. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 that God sees what? The end from the beginning. So who was it here that told Noah to prepare for something that was coming? It was God. And what did God see? Things that he, things that we did not see. Let's pick it up again. It says, by faith Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. What did he do? He moved with fear. And what else? He prepared an ark for the saving of his house by the which he did what? He condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So Noah now, the Bible says he moved by faith. So was Noah a prayer man? If he had faith, he was studying the Bible, was he not? If he had faith, he had a relationship with God, did he not? However, did Noah, though he had faith in God, though he had a relationship with God, did Noah... Still not went ahead and did a physical work that God had him to do. Yes. Could God have saved Noah without the boat? Yeah. Amen. He could have. God could have saved Noah without the boat. But if Noah did not build the boat, would he have been saved? No. no. Because you see here, there's a combination of a spiritual work that Noah did in his life, which is represented by the faith that he had. And the physical work, which he did with the hammer and the wood to build that boat, represented his faith that was working. Yes. Yes. Do we see that? Yes. The Bible says that faith without works is yes. dead. In other words, has God also told us about a crisis that is coming? Did he also give us a country living message that we must obtain to? Yes. Yes. Is that faith and works working together? Yes. We're not going to get into country living just yet. But I just wanted to make that point. It says Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So Noah did not only listen to the message. Amen. Amen. He did not only know how to recite the three angels messages, but this shows that the very principles that he applied in his life was the principles of that message that he studied. Amen. Do we see that? Amen. Many of us know the three angels' message. Yes. Many of us know what's coming. 
but yet we have not applied the principles that are found in those messages. That's presumptions. No. Amen. And if we are committing presumptuous sin, will God save us? No. What was the third temptation that Christ faced in the wilderness? Presumption. It was presumption. Yes. The devil told Christ, if you are truly the son of God, just go ahead and jump over that mountain and God will take care of you. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say to the devil? It is written. What did he say? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we have also been given a message, a warning message. And Christ says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be before the coming of the Son of Man. So in studying the life of Noah and even looking at this passage, we can see that the very thing that took place then, not in, in, in the same, the same uh, actual flood, but the very warning message that took place then, God is trying to warn his people in these last days. Do you know that is the first principle of studying prophet the prophecies? Do you know that? Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I always have to make this point. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 9. Notice what the Bible says. You know, Ellen White says, in times of so much sermonizing, God's people need to come together and study the Bible point by point, word by word, so that they may understand what they believe. Amen? Amen. So I'm not going to give you my opinion this evening. I'm going to show you what does say of the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. Someone who has it, please read. Amen. But things that have been, it is that which shall be and things that are to be. Amen. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Amen. Amen. So the thing that have been, that deals with the past, yeah. is that which shall be, that deals with the future. And that which is done, that deals with the present, is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. Do we see the principle here being applied in the life of Noah that or, or, or the principle or the thing that took place in the life of Noah do we see Christ trying to bring our minds back to it to show us that truly the things that took place in the past will be repeated yes. Amen? Amen Well let's go to the book of Daniel We're going to go to the book of Daniel Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And I want to begin here at verse 23. Daniel chapter 8. In verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, are we there? Amen. Amen. It says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy what? Wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And verse 25 says, and through his policy, he shall also cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace, he shall destroy Many. So who is this power that the Bible is here referring to? How do we know that? The Bible says that his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 13, verse 12 here. Revelation chapter 13.
The Bible says that this power will be mighty. This power shall destroy wonderfully God's people. And this power will have policies that will cause him to prosper in craft and deceitfulness, guile. And then the Bible says, this power shall magnify himself and is hard. Matter of fact, before we go to Revelation 13, let's back up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How do we know this power? The Bible says he shall magnify himself where? In his... Where? In his... In his heart. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 3. Are we there? All right, I see you still looking. I'll give you some time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. The Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, but that they shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that men of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is as... God sitteth in the temple of God and showing himself that he is God. The Bible says in verse number seven that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So there is a mystery of iniquity that is already working. And this mystery of iniquity, the Bible says, magnifies itself in his heart. This power sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. But notice what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 8. The Daniel says that this is the policy that this power shall use to destroy many and by peace. By peace, this power shall destroy 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What does it say here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 3. Notice what the Bible says here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Somebody have it? It says in verse number 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So here Paul, Paul is showing us that this power that is using this policy of peace and safety to truly bring about destruction upon the world. So the power that we see in Daniel chapter 8, verse number 23, all the way down to 25, is none other than the Roman Catholic Church. It is the papacy. And Paul says the papacy would lift up itself above God, would even want the homage and worship that was due to God. Do you know of a power who wanted the homage that was due to God? In heaven, Isaiah chapter 14. The Bible says Lucifer said, I wanted to be like God. I wanted to be in the throne of God. I wanted to sit on the highest side of the north. I wanted to be like God. And so here we see that the very same spirit that possessed Lucifer is the same spirit that is behind this, this church. And the Bible says this church is the mystery of iniquity. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 17. We see the mystery of iniquity revealed in Revelation chapter 17. I want to begin at verse number 1. And if I'm going too fast, I'm just trying to catch up with the time. <laughs> Revelation chapter 17. In verse 1, the Bible says, And there came one of the seven angels. We're looking for what? The definition of the mystery of iniquity. And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, or come here. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. What is a woman in Bible prophecy? 
We all know that. The church. Give me a verse to prove it. Let's go to Jeremiah 6.2. Jeremiah 6.2. Jeremiah 6.2. Very good. 1 Corinthians 10.2. This says that this woman is a whore. Is God's church represented as a whore or as a virgin? A, virgin. a pure woman. A comely and delicate woman. Amen? Yes. But here we see that this woman is not truly keeping... It's vow with her husband. What is the vow of God? It is his commandments. It is his commandments. So the Bible says that this woman is not a pure woman, but this woman is a whore. Let's continue. It says, come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Revelation 17 verse 15 reveals what the water symbolizes. Amen. It says, with whom? What? What classify this woman as a whore? What are the principles that this woman follows that depicts her as a whore? Verse number two says, she is committing fornication with whom? With the kings of the earth. In other words, this woman is a mixture of church and state. Amen? It is a mixture of church and state. We will see that clearly in Revelation chapter 17. The Bible says, And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And this wine we know to be a symbol of the false teachings, the false doctrines of this church. Every, you know, did you know that every false doctrine really comes from the Roman Catholic Church? Did you know that every false church comes out of the Roman Catholic Church? Even the Mormon Church, the Muslims, they all comes out, come out of this church. Because the Bible says she is the one that has the wine for the world to drink. And she is the mother of all harlots. Let's continue. It says here in verse number three, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a Woman. What does a woman symbolize? Church. A church. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet color. What does the B symbolize? A kingdom. I'll take that. So the woman is sitting upon a. So there is a unification of church and state. In God's eyes, when his church unifies with the state, that is depicted as fornication. In fact, Jesus says, when they came to him with the coin, they says, whose inscription is on that coin? Jesus looked at the coin and he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God. And even this country, the United States of America, was founded upon the great principle of the separation between church and state. Amen. Amen. The first amendment to the Constitution says that Congress cannot make any laws respecting any establishment of religion. Amen? Amen. Amen. But today we live in a world where most people are familiar with the Second Amendment. They say, don't take our guns away. But if you ask them what the First Amendment says, I dare you, I challenge you. Ask anybody at your job. Most of them might not know what it says. But if you ask them what the Second Amendment says, they will tell you. The most important amendment is the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees or should guarantee the separation between church and state. But the Bible says there's coming a time, and yet that time is even now, where this constitutional right will be taken away from us. And the Bible says that this country who comes out of the earth will speak as a dragon. Let's continue. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Someone who claims to be God. It is someone who claims to be God. More specifically, someone who claims to have the power to forgive Sin. sins. And this church is the only church who claims to have the power to forgive sins. Even though Christ says there is only one God, and one mediator between God and man, that man who? Christ. Jesus Christ. So how can a church 
claims to have the very mediatorship of Christ in his hand. That constitutes blasphemy. It says here, and the woman was full of names of blasphemy, having how many heads? Seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in what? And purple. What does arrayed mean? The woman was dressed in what color? The woman was arrayed in what color? And purple and scarlet. What is scarlet? Red. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color decked with what? Gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand. What's in the golden cup? Full of the abominations and the filthiness of her What's in the cup? The abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. We need to break this down. The woman was dressed in purple. Let's look at the dress of this woman. She was dressed in purple and scarlet color. What does the color scarlet represent in the Bible? Sin. Though your sin be as scarlet, I will make them as so. How is God's true church dressed in the Bible? Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We see another woman. And we need to mark the attire of this woman. The Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the... Son. Who's the son? Jesus. The son of righteousness. And the moon was under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child, child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. Well, you get the point. The woman is dressed in proper attire, even as a comely and delicate woman. But we see in Revelation 17, this woman is not dressed as a virgin, but dressed as a whore. You want to know what else a whore wear, wears? Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to offend. Yes, sir. But we got we to gotta look at what the Bible says. Amen. Let's see further what else a whore wears. The Bible says, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with what? Gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So this woman is dressed in all kind of ornaments. Gold. Silver. Amen? Pearls. All of these things that are not needed. All of these things that are not necessary for us to adorn ourselves in. Amen? And we see that this woman is dressed in a way that is so prerogative that it is so attracting whereby she would attract the attentions of kings and cause them to want to fornicate with her. Yes. My brother just mentioned in this message a little while ago why we have not been persecuted. Why persecution is lacking. And I actually read that same quote and I was startled by it. The reason why persecution is lingering is because we have to a greater degree compromise with the world. We have compromised with the standards of the world. And as a result of that, because we are just like the world, we are dressed like the world, we eat, we drink, we act like the world. The world does not recognize us as a threat. Amen. Notice what the Bible says. We're looking for the definition of mystery of iniquity. The Bible says in verse number five, still describing the same woman, and upon her, what, what, what was on her forehead? A name. A name, have mercy. My brother just preach about the? Name. Which name? Brothers and sisters, if we are dressed like this woman, if we eat like this woman, whose name shall we have on our foreheads? It says, and upon her forehead, 
was a name. So what is embedded in the character of this woman? Let's go to Revelation chapter 14 real quick. Let's go back there. Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says in verse number one, we need to compare and contrast the name of the true church embedded in the character of the true church versus the name of the whore. Because if we don't understand by contrast, the differences between these two names, we might receive the wrong name. And we need to walk out of here this evening understanding and knowing which name has been embedded in our foreheads. Some of us, though we are not wearing the outward appearances in the heart, the name of God has not been stamped upon us. Notice what it says. And I looked at Lord Lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And the Bible says in verse number four, these are they, those who have God's name in their foreheads. These are they which were not defiled with, which women did not defile the 144,000? The Roman Catholic Church along with her daughter churches. The principles of the Roman Catholic Church. The teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. The way that they dress. The things that they do. These things did not defile, did not corrupt the true women. The true church. Amen? Amen. Do we see a lot of defilement coming into our church today? Do we see a lot of uh, 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 celebrations that are coming into our church. As a church now we celebrate Mother's Day. Amen? As a church now we celebrate Father's Day. I even see in one of the churches they were celebrating Halloween but they gave it a different name. As a church we celebrate some of us we have it the week before Valentine's Day. We change the name, but yet we still represent the character of that church. And yet we think in God's eyes we are okay. Which name is written upon our foreheads? It says, notice what it says. It says in verse 4, these are they which were not defiled. What does it mean to be defiled? To be tainted. To be corrupted. These are they which were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb where? Where is the Lamb right now? In the most holy place. And what is the Lamb doing in the most holy place? Is he investigating the clothing of his true church? Is he? Do you remember the story? When Christ walks into the wedding... And he says to that man, how did you get in here not having on what? A wedding garment. He says, bind him head and foot and get him out of here. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Some of us think we're going to go without a wedding garment. And we, before we put on Christ's garment, we need to take off the garments of the? The garments of the? Did we not see that last night at Romans chapter 13? Let's go back there. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse number 11. There is a garment that we need to put on. And before we do that, we need to take off the garment of the flesh. Romans 13 verse 11. The Bible says in that knowing the time that now it is high time to do what? Awake out of what do we need to do church? To awake out of sleep. Are we sleeping as a church? Yes. Ellen White says that our greatest need is a need for a revival and a reformation. We're not even sleeping yet. We're dead. We're not sleeping no more. We are dead. The concept of reviving someone is because you need to bring back life into that person. To revive means to bring back to life. And we are no longer sleeping, but we are dead. It says in that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep 
For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at which day is at hand. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Is it not our at hand? Yes. The day is at hand. Let us therefore do what? Cast. Did the Bible says mask? It says cast off. That means take it off. Cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on what? The armor of. So what must we do in order to put on the armor of light? Take off the armor of the flesh. Some of us have come into the church with the armor of the flesh and we want to mask it by the armor of light. But brothers and sisters, though you might fool men, but we have a God in heaven who says he looked, he looked not at the outside appearance, but he looks into the heart. We need to cast off the armor of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, brothers and sisters. The lust of the, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world and the world is passing away and the lust thereof but who will remain forever those who do with the will of God will abide forever let's go back to Revelation 17 Revelation 17 is the spirit moving on your heart this evening amen, amen. Revelation 17 Let's look at this again. The Bible says, and upon her forehead, verse number five, and upon her forehead was a name written, mystery. This is the mystery of iniquity that Paul was talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter two and verse number seven. Mystery, Babylon the great. Is this such a mystery anymore? No, brothers and sisters. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. How can you tell a mother and a daughter? How can you tell that a mother and a daughter are related? Look at the characteristics. Look at the characters. If you look at the character of a daughter, you will be able to link her to her mother. The Bible says the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Which characteristics link the Roman Catholic Church with her other daughter churches? Two principal doctrines, we are told. They are the two pillars of Babylon, which is Sunday worship and the immortality of the soul. Every other church is connected somehow, some way to the Roman Catholic Church through these two doctrines. And we are the only church that does not teach that once you die, you go to heaven. I was at a once Seventh-day Adventist church once and I heard someone say that once you die, you go to heaven. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we have Seventh-day Adventists in our church today who does not understand the spirit, the state of the dead. The state of the dead. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, you might think these are basic doctrines, but there are Seventh-day Adventists today who don't understand the state of the dead. Do you know that Ellen White says she saw in the last days there was a train of cars? Yes. And on that train of cars, she says, it seemed like the whole world was on that train. Yes. And then she saw the conductor of that train. Yes. She asked her accompanying angel who was the conductor. And the angel said it was Satan himself, dressed as an angel of light. Yes. And the whole world was heading at lightning speed to perdition. Spiritualism is going to be used mightily in these last days. Matter of fact, let's go to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to go back to Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 16. The Bible says in verse number 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are spirits of devils working 
miracles. So what are the spirits of devils will be doing in the last days? Working miracles. And they're going to go forth unto the kings of the earth. Question. Who were the kings of the earth in bed with? The harlot. The harlot. So if the spirits of devils are working miracles and going forth unto the kings of the earth, and if the kings of the earth are in bed with the harlot church, is the whole world going to be deceived by these miracles? Amen. No? Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 13, speaking of the second beast power, which represents the United States of America. The Bible says in verse number 13, let's begin at verse number 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth what? Great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. So if you are a Christian who is primarily moved by miracles and signs, will you be deceived in the last days? Do you know what Ellen White says? You know what Ellen White says? She says that in the last days, God's people won't be working so much miracles. Do you know that? Don't be fooled. Because the enemy is going to work great miracles in these last days. And the Bible says by each miracle, what's going to be our test? What's going to be our test? Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So our test to every miracle, the test that our pastor must pass, our first elder, our deacons, what is the test they must pass? The test of Isaiah 820. If they speak not according to the word of God, it is because there is no light in them. And if you are following someone who has no light in them, what shall happen? They will both fall into a ditch. Brothers and sisters, we have come to a place where the Seventh-day Seventh -day Adventist Church, the leadership of this church, to a greater degree, are walking in darkness. And the flock is following after them in darkness, and they will all fall into a... Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 9, this has always been the case. And we are repeating the history of ancient Israel. Isaiah chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says here. Isaiah 9. The Bible says in verse 14, are you there? Yeah. Isaiah 9 verse 14. The Bible says, therefore the Lord will cut, will cut off from Israel... Head and tail. Who's the head? We'll find out later. Head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable. Who are the ancient and honorable? That's the elders. That's the leadership of the church. The ancient and the honorable. He is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies. He is the tail. Verse 16. For the leaders of this people cause them to err. The leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is causing the people to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Brothers and sisters, if you are following after the head who has no light in him, you will err. Let's go back to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. I want to stick to the message tonight. Revelation 17. The Bible says, and upon her forehead was a name, verse 5, written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. Many a time we focus on this, we talk about the Roman Catholic Church, we talk about the daughter churches, but we have not been truly assessing the condition that we are finding in our church. 
I'm showing you today as I'm comparing and contrasting the message of Brother Akeem as he brought it, that just as you can receive the name of God, you can also receive the name of the enemy. You can also receive in your forehead that mystery, Babylon the Great, that name we need to avoid. Amen? Where are we going? Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Amen. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 17. The Bible says in verse number 13. This is powerful. Verse 13, the Bible says, These have how many mind? One mind. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So here we see, brothers and sisters, that in these last days, the world, that's right, the Republicans, the Democrats, that includes the one who's running for president, too. What's his name? Ben Kevin. Ben, ben, that includes the, Rep the Republicans and the Democrats, the Muslims, oh yes, the Roman Catholic Church, and all the other churches that does not want to accept the Sabbath and the spirit of prophecy truth, they will have one mind. That's why it's foolish to get involved in politics. <laughs> That's why it's foolish to get involved in party lines. Because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, you are either with the Roman Catholic Church or you are with the Church of God. There's only two camps. And it is foolish as a Seventh-day Adventist for us to get involved in these things. These all have one mind. And the Bible says that we can't be down with this one mind, but there is a mind that we all must have if we are God's true people. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Which mind must we have? The mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says here, somebody who has it, go ahead and read. What is it? What, what, what? I have it here. Go ahead. Verse number five. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, mm. but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Mm. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Stop right there. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I just showed you the mind of the whore. Was it a mind of humility? No. The Bible says he elevated himself, did he not? Yes. He's sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. But here we see that the mind of Christ that we are to have is a mind of humility. It says he humbled himself and did what? And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. That means, brothers and sisters, if we are to have the mind of Christ in these last days, we have to be ready to carry the cross. And even if it means death, we have to say, then let this mind be in me. Amen? Because that's coming. There's coming a time when persecution will be rekindled. Amen? Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14. I'm closing now. We're almost done. Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, in verse number 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud 
loud voice. If, how many men? Any man worship the beast in his image and receive his, what is the mark of the beast? But are we in the Seventh day Adventist room? It is the National Sunday Law. Brothers and sisters, I was at a Seventh day Adventist church. I won't name names. And the pastor says the mark of the beast is not the National Sunday Law, but the mark of the beast is the character of Satan. Well, what is the character of Satan then? <laughs> is it not Sunday? Is it, is it Sunday part of the character of Satan? He said it's not the National Sunday Law. And this is a seven day Adventist pastor. And I sat him down with my brother, Brother Bernard Lewis, and we showed him through the Bible and through the spirit of prophecy. Then he says, well, you know, I haven't really read the great controversy. In other words, he was saying, I do not give that book any credit. The prophet says that the last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimonies. And we are seeing this happening right now in our church to a greater degree. People are saying, well, Ellen White, oh, she, who, who is Ellen White? We, we, all we have is the Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the remnant of God's people have the word of God in hand and the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 says it is the spirit of prophecy. So how can you claim to be a seven-day Adventist and yet you are not you don't want to associate yourself with the writings of the prophet. Amen. The same spirit that convicted Isaiah and John and Jeremiah to write the Bible is the same spirit that convicted Ellen White to write the spirit of prophecy. Amen. And how can you say, brothers and sisters, that you do not believe in this? Did you know that whenever God was about to destroy his people... Whenever God was going to bring about judgment upon his people... The last thing... That he would, that they would do would be, they would reject the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah. You want to see that in the Bible for yourself? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's go to. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter thirty. Six. I'm going to show it to you in the Old and New Testament. We need two witnesses. Amen? Amen. Before God was getting ready to bring judgment upon his people, the last thing that his people would do, they would reject the prophets. Amen? Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 14. You want to write these texts down and go back home and go over them. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 14, the Bible says, moreover, are we there? Amen. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgress very much after all the abominations of the heathen. So who were God's people accustomed to following after? The heathens. It says here, and polluted what? They polluted the church of God. They polluted the church of God, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Verse 15. And what did God do? And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes. That means early. And sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words. And what did they do to the prophets? They misused the prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. So what did they do before the wrath of God fell upon his people? They despised the prophets. Can we find that in the New Testament? Let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear. We need to study God's word. We need to study God's words and stop listening to these 
mushy sermons. These one-liners with one scripture here, one scripture there, and then the rest of it is all man's opinion. We ought to obey God rather than man. Amen. In these last days, we cannot depend upon the opinions of man. We need to hear a thus save the Lord. Matthew 23. Notice what Jesus says here. Matthew 23. When you have time, you need to read this whole chapter on your own. Matthew 23, the Bible says in verse 34, amen? amen. Matthew 23 and verse 34, the Bible says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you what? Prophets. What did he send unto us? Prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. And some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Is this not what is happening with God's true people inside of his own church? Yes. Ellen White says we have more to fear from within than from without. So God's true prophets, God's true people are being persecuted in, his, in, in the church from city to city. We have, made, we have been made uncomfortable. Why? Because we keep to the law and to the testimony. Verse 35, it says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel and unto Zechariah. Did Cain kill his brother Abel? Yes. Were they brothers? Yes. Were they in the same church? Yes. Why did Cain murder his own brother? The Bible says because his works was evil and his brother's works was Righteous. Why will God's own people persecute their brothers? Because their brothers are trying to live righteously. Paul says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So when we are suffering persecution, do we need to give God praise for that? That means we are living godly, brothers and sisters. But we must be careful. Because 1 Peter chapter 4 says, let not that persecution come because of your own mistakes. Amen. We need to be suffering persecution for a righteous cause. Let's continue. It says here, verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee. What do we do to those who are sent unto us? We stone them. We kill them. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not? Judgment hour time. Verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth until you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So what happened to the prophets in the Old Testament? Kill them. They killed them. What came about after that? The wrath of God. What happened to the prophets in the New Testament? They killed them. What happened after that? The wrath of God. What is the connection between the Old and the New? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, 9. The thing that have been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is how many new things? No new things under the sun. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the National Sunday Law is coming. And though this Pope might not come out of this event with an actual uh, law that says, okay, we have the National Sunday Law. Believe you me, the foundations have already been made. And what he is coming to do is to seal the deal. He's coming to seal the deal. And God, by his mercy is still holding on to the four winds of strife. And Ellen White says, we need to pray for more time, brothers and sisters. Amen. We need to pray for more time because we are not ready for what is coming upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. We need to tarry in prayer and we need to ask the Lord to help us that we may bear his name. Amen. Yeah. On our foreheads? Yeah. No, in our foreheads. The name is in, not on the forehead. We got to be careful with these other Bible versions too, brothers and sisters. Notice what this says here.
Amen. Well, the quote is, is Amen. All right, I just want to show you a few slides here as we conclude. So we have, we have John Banner here who is announcing the coming of the Pope to the papacy. And he addresses him as your holiness. He says, your holiness. And this is the institution that is supposed to protect the laws of the land. And as I was saying yesterday, this is something that we need to think about. I was not around around JFK's presidency. Who was? Who was around around JFK when he was running? Do you remember? I did my research. Do you remember that when he was running for president, because he was a Roman Catholic candidate, that he was scrutinized for that simple fact? Yes, yes. Do you remember what he had to do to gain the confidence of the American people? He had to go in front of a board of evangelicals. And he was grilled. They asked him questions after questions after questions to answer whether or not he would govern his presidency after the dictates of the papacy. And finally, they said, okay, we trust him. We let him go. And Kennedy did not want to govern after the dictates of the papacy. Yes, he believed in a separation between church and state. And that is one of the biggest reasons why he was killed. Because he did not want to go along with the papacy. And brothers and sisters, here we are now, fast forward how many years? 30, 40? Give or take? 50? Okay. Fast forward 50 years, and I stand corrected. We now have the actual Pope. Listen. This is how much technology to a greater degree and the concept of false education has brainwashed the American people. Fast forward now to 2015, the Roman Catholic Church Pope is coming to the U.S. to address the United States Congress where laws are enacted. And no one says anything. Nobody. Even the brothers, do we see the prophecies fulfilling, brothers and sisters? Yes. And not even the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As leadership, should they not be given certain uh, messages to the people? As unto how we need to prepare ourselves for this. Yes. But yet we are silent on the matter. Yes, sir. Why? Because we have come to see things in the same light. I read from the great controversy. Some of us need to pick up this book and study. I read from the great controversy. Page 571. Listen. She says the Roman church now presents a fair front to the world. Covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelty. Is the Pope going around apologizing to the world? Is the Pope going around and saying, we are sorry for what we did during the Dark Ages? Is the Pope going around and washing people's feet and kissing babies and saying, we have erred, forgive us. We have the solutions to the problem of the world. Global warming, have mercy. Global warming, do you believe in global warming? Do you believe in the scientific? There is global warming going on because Christ says these things would happen. We are foretold these things in Matthew chapter 24, that the, there would be signs and, and then the weather and all of these things would be chaotic. But the global warming that they are promoting is not the one that Matthew 24 was talking about. The Roman church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies a record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed, listen, she has clothed herself in Christ-like 
garments. Mercy. Deception. <laughs> she has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is on change. Mm -hmm. There are leaders in our church today who are saying we cannot preach the mark of the beast anymore because that does not apply to the Roman church Mercy. anymore. They have changed. Uh -huh. They are feeding the hungry. They are healing the sick. They are doing this and they are doing that. But the Bible says that the characteristics of the Roman Catholic Church is that of a leper. <laughs> Have you ever looked into the leper? <laughs> Do you know what a leper does when he's hunting? <laughs> Brothers, a leopard is an animal that lays around in the bushes, in the grass. As if you... You can be you around the leopard, and the prey does not even see the leopard. The leopard pays the prey no mind. And when the prey least expect, he goes for the kill. This is the character of the characteristics of the papacy. And we are told, brothers and sisters, that she has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is on change. Listen now. Every principle, how many principles? Every. Every principle of popery that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The popery that Protestants, yea, even seven Adventists, are now ready to honor is the same that ruled the world. I gotta say something here. I was looking at I was looking on the news and I saw Ted Wilson meeting with the Secretary of the United Nations. Then I saw another picture of the Secretary of the United Nations shaking hand with the Popery. Can light and darkness mix together? And what Ted Wilson said was that the reason why he was meeting is to work on issues that dealt with uh, terrorism and religious intolerance. How can you meet on issues of religious intolerance with the United Nations when the very agenda of the United Nations is to destroy religious freedom? Mercy. These have one mind. The United Nations, are they united in Christ? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. Every principle of popery that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The popery that Protestants are now ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation. When men of God stood upon at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity, she possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. Popery is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. Listen to what the prophet says. It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from the Protestantism than in former times. Did you understand what she says? She's saying that what Protestants are saying is that Catholics has changed to a greater degree. But the prophet says, oh yeah, there has been a change. But the change is not with the papacy. Let me repeat, let me, let me repeat that. I think I... The prophet says that Protestants are saying that the papacy has changed. But the prophet says there has been a change, but it is not with the papacy, but rather it is the Protestants that have changed. Catholicism indeed resembles much 
of the Protestantism that now exists because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the reformers. There has been a change, but it is not with the papacy. The same doctrines, the same principles that were held during the Dark Ages are still held today. Brothers and sisters, for this reason, country living is a must. Did you know that? That's a whole other message. And I was going to present on it and try to combine, but I see we're out of time. Sisters back there saying, yes, we'll do it in the morning. Country living is a must because we need to understand how to go out of the cities and begin to plant for our brothers. And sisters. I have not apprehended yet. I'm praying God for the same thing, brothers and sisters. I realize that even as Job, every, every piece of earthly support will be covered. And what will it mean to you when you have no electricity, when you have no heat, when you cannot cook food? Will you still hold on to Jesus or will you receive the mark of the beast? Your bank account will not matter at that time. In fact, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Some of us will receive the mark on our hand for the love of money. Brothers and sisters, now is the time. Now is the time. It is high time to awake out of sleep. We're not ready. I'm not ready. And brothers and sisters, Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. And there is no greater deception than to know what's coming and you are still not ready. Can you imagine only eight people went on that boat? Eight people were... How many elders do you think lived back then? You think there are some pastors around here? Eight people were saved. They heard the message for 120 years. Eight people were saved. People lived longer back then. Can you imagine listening to a message for 120 years and still be lost? Brothers and sisters, some of us, we are fourth generation seven Adventists. We are second generation seven Adventists. But if Christ were to come right now, Ellen White says that not one in 20 in the church. How many people are here? Not one in 20. Already to close out their earthly history. Not one in 20. What's the percentage, Sister Susan? She's a math teacher. Five. Five percent. What are we now? What's, what's the number of the church? Membership. We look, 17 billion? Not million. Million? million? Have mercy. Not one in 20. She'll later change that to one in 100. Mercy. One in a hundred. So who in here, you don't have to raise your hand, is ready to close out his earthly history? Who's ready to close out his earthly history right here? Or her, who's ready? Brothers and sisters, we cannot go home and just have this be another revival. Yeah. Revival without a reformation is just noise. We need a reformation. So I'm asking you, this is solemn, this is important, this is serious, not one in 20. Brothers and sisters, come up, we need to pray right now. Not one in twenty. All to Jesus.
Let's surrender our heart to God. This is the upper room experience. Oh, to 